So, back to my true rambling style, where I'm not even responding to anyone. Um, and unfortunately, much of what's going on in my life, I'm not at liberty to talk about. It's not like I'm a, a spy with top secret clearance or anything. It's just, uh, it's about professionality. And when you know things, you're not allowed to say them in public without looking bad, really bad, as a business owner. So, I hear all these things that you know, I'd love to gossip about, but I can't. And it, it kills me, it really does. Um, for years, having a YouTube channel where I can say anything I fucking want, and then I can't say shit about some things that have been happening to me recently, and I won't be able to for years, years until it's all over and uh, everyone's forgotten about it and it can't hurt anyone, you know, years, I gotta keep a secret for years, well not really like a secret secret, but I can't be broadcasting shit out on YouTube, that really... Um, it sucks when those things are, like, at the forefront of my mind and I want to ramble and say shit. Um, but we're going to start with the beginning of my day. Um, I had to go take a blood test at the VA. Because, uh, the doctor that took me off of some of my medication just to find out what would happen uh, set it for a month and it had been a month and I got a little uh, call and voicemail and they tell you that you have to go in well I go in there and I thought I was gonna have like a, a full appointment you know like uh, turn your head and cough and does this hurt does this hurt does it no I didn't have any of that. I sat in the lobby for like 30 minutes going, um, my voicemail said I have an appointment at 7, and there's no one here, and half the fucking lights are not on in the fucking building. What the fuck is going on here? So, the, uh, receptionist gets there at 8, but luckily, um, she decided to come in early and just set up shop at 7.30. I'd already been there for 30 minutes. And I hand her my VA identification card and say, I think I have an appointment at 7, but nobody's here. Well, turns out I did have an appointment, but it wasn't with a doctor. It was just to get my blood drawn. That was it. And down the hall, there was one person working in a lab and and had been taking blood for other people since I'd been there. They'd been walking past me, and they knew what was what was up. I didn't know. But, uh, yeah, the doctor didn't want to see me, just wanted a blood test. Didn't want to ask about, like, uh, well, how has it been? since we took you off your medication. Have you been feeling, oh, say, depressed during the holiday season because stress is getting to you because I took you off your medication? No. She don't want to hear anything like that. She just wants to know what my blood levels are. So, yeah. And, and it's at some level, part of me doesn't want to talk to her anyway. Yeah, I've been fucking dealing with a lot of crap and didn't need her to be fucking testing me like a fucking lab rat. But, um, if she just wants my blood test and, and she's just going to, you know, prescribe me my medication after finding out that yes, I do indeed need it, then fine. So, I go in there. Um, after waiting for 30 minutes just to find out that I didn't have to wait for 30 minutes I could have just gone down the hall 
I get my blood test, or my blood drawn, it took like two minutes when I was out of there. And I was putting my jacket on, and I stepped into a different hallway, right? And I took a picture of something that I saw because it was so out of place for me to see this. And I'm going to share with you guys the picture because I just think it's interesting. It's, uh, I guess it's a historical picture because there was a, a, a lot of uh, these posters that were like reproductions of like recruiting slogans. And this picture says, Gee, I wish I were a man. I'd join the Navy. And it has a picture of a, a girl in a, a Navy sailor's outfit. Um, looking cute. <laughs> and then it's it says below that, Be a man and do it. United States Navy recruiting station. And so... Not trollingly, just like um, being genuine, you know, I posted it to my Facebook and, and people up it, it, and, and then I shared it to the We Are Women group, and to their Facebook group, you know, because it was really like, it was out of place. Like, I get that it's, it's to show how far we've come as a country but really I don't think it's it's one of those things we need to enshrine in poster form on the inside of a hospital run by Veterans Affairs no it's, it's like it's it's putting a little gilded border around misogyny. You know? <sighs> Makes me want to watch The Honeymooners or All in the Family. Do something nostalgic. Anyways, 3 o'clock comes around and I couldn't get to my phone because I was handling customers in my market, but I got a voicemail message from my nurse, the super nurse, the one that uh, talks for the doctor, and I actually think that nurses in the VA system have a lot more power than the doctors. The doctors just kind of sign things. So the nurse calls and, and says, um... We're going to go ahead and prescribe you your medication again. We, we do see that your your levels are low, and you do legitimately need this. So, what we'd like to know is, are you going to come in for your shots, or do you want to do them at home? Well, I have to do them at home, because their shot clinic, uh, it starts at like 1 p.m. and goes to like 3 p.m. And in those two hours, if I want to go to that shot clinic, I have to have somebody watching the till in my market rather than being there myself. And I do that for other things, but that's just one thing that I can like eliminate and not have to pay someone to be watching my business. You know? So I do my shots myself. And there's... It's also like a, a, a cost thing of like, it's an extra, I guess, four gallons of gas to get down to the clinic and back, you know, from my shop. So, why pay the gas money to take the trip and, and take the time out of my life when I could just have it sent to me in the mail? Now, unfortunately, I'm not home when my medication is, uh, they, they, they attempt the first delivery, so I get a little card, and they stick it to the, the door, and sometimes it falls off, and I have to call and get the tracking number and all. But then I have to go to the post office on my way to work and pick up my medication, and I have even given myself a shot. 
wow at the till, because I can. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's just a matter of alcohol swabs, uh, sterile needles, and a vial. So, I don't think there... It's not rocket science or brain surgery. And if you're going to use those analogies, please do not say brain science or rocket surgery. Somebody said that to me at the till the other day. And I was caught off guard by how he said it's not brain science. And, yeah. I deal with a lot of different people. I see a lot of different, odd people. That was Kenny who said that. I'll say his name. Fuck it. Um, Kenny came in wearing a t-shirt from his uh, company... And I looked right at him, and I said, wow! You know, and, and both of us are, like, between 2X and 3X, but, you know, I was trying to give him a compliment, and I said, wow! I didn't know they made those t-shirts in barrel-chested. Because <laughs> we're husky. Anyways. Um, so she calls, leaves a message on, on my phone and I have to call back and leave a message and say yes I want to take my shots at home please call it in to the, the Denver clinic so that they mail it to me in that whole secure fashion where I only get a little bit because they don't want somebody to steal my mail and I'm like hmm why was this even a question because that's what we were doing before. Before someone decided that they just wanted, out of the blue, to um, test to see whether or not I needed my medication. Which is the second time it's happened in this year. Um, because I, I, had, I got a new doctor at the VA. I don't have the same doctor anymore. Not my decision. My old one just retired. And... I wonder if this will happen every time I get a new doctor. Because <laughs> I don't feel like that's a reason for me to have to uh, prove that I need this medication. And I keep calling it this medication. It is uh, Depo Testosterone, and I have a whole series on the first ten shots that I took. It's on my YouTube channel. Um probably in a playlist somewhere. So, that that's what we're talking about here. Okay? And when you go off of testosterone, cold fucking turkey, your brain will explode when certain things happen. Like, surprise, you just took a faith-healing church into your market. You know? you will start to really have anxiety and chest pains and like like red fox like ah oh, I'm having a hot attack you know it's and you'll start rambling on YouTube to try to vent because no one understands. <sighs> By the way there are some things that you can do to uh, affect a blood test, which uh, the first blood test at the beginning of this uh, month ordeal, um, I did not do with that, that first blood test. Um, things that can make it look like you are low T. Um, the first of which, and I did not do this, and this is why, I had to go for a month without my medication because that, that blood test showed that I was normal. Um, and I didn't even do it this time, but I knew I'd be low T because I haven't been on the shot. But if you, if you need a low reading, 
and you're already somebody who's like average or low, this is what you do. Um, and this is from bodybuilding science too. Okay, like if you if you're wanting to do bodybuilding, do the opposite of this. First thing that you'd want to do if you want to have a low T reading is ejaculate. Now you can jerk off yourself or you can have sex. Either way, that is bad for your testosterone reading for about four hours. Also, you don't want to work out in the next four hours after ejaculation. It's just workout science. You're going to be lower in testosterone after climaxing. So, here's one thing that you could do that I didn't do that I wish I did because I wouldn't have had to go through this month. I should have jerked off. Number two thing you can do if you know that you're going to have a blood test and you need to look like a low T person, the number two thing you can do is stay up as late as fucking possible. In fact, if you can go in 48 hours sleep deprived, that would be ideal, but I can't even make it that far. Like, seriously, I can't make it 36 hours. How Dev Shell does that with his fucking uh, charity shit, I don't know because I would collapse at around 30. I just know me. My brain shuts down. So, yeah, you can try to be as tired as fucking possible. And the reason why you want to do this is your testosterone is replaced in your body in your sleep. It's part of your sleep cycle that it gets re generated in your body. So, if you don't go to sleep, like say you, you stay up until the, the, the point where you have to take your blood test, and your blood test is right after you've been up for more than 24 hours, you're going to have a lower reading. Also, something that I did not fucking do for the blood test that showed that I was kind of Durable ish The reason why that, that blood test a month ago showed that I was normal and made my doctor wonder, do I really need my medication? The reason why was I had just taken my shot, like, a couple days before that, and not two weeks before that. And the reason why I had to take that blood test when I took it was because I have another medication for my thyroid, which doesn't exist. Um, and my brother's chihuahua had gone into my pocket, picked up out the uh, pill bottle without me knowing, took it into the backyard, and chewed it up, and lost half my pills. And I was at the end of my prescription. I had no refills left. Right? And to get a refill on that... I had to take a blood test. And it didn't dawn on me that my doctor was going to test everything about my blood, not just for level of thyroxine. So, you know, the, the TSH level in my, in my blood. So, I go in for one thing to fix that, to get a, a, my, my other prescription filled, and I get pulled off of the other thing. That's what I've been dealing with, people. That's why I'm shooting laser beams out of my eyes. Holy fuck. I'm looking at, my, at the screen. I'm doing, like, the regular YouTube upload. I got some fucking zombie bags under my eyes. Wow. Zombie bags. Yeah, I need to go to sleep. Because tomorrow... The uh, church that believes that they are called by the Holy Spirit to give business clothes to job seekers and hand out food, which I have no problem with their two ministry things, even though some might think that there's kind of a conservative bent to the uh, not specializing in t-shirts or baby clothes or 
you know, sweatpants, but just business suits to get everyone off of the dole and into a job, you know, there, it seems like it's a little not as compassionate for what people's needs are, because people need um, more than just a business suit, but, you know, teach a person to fish, I guess, is the, their philosophy. Anyways, they're going to be at my market tomorrow, handing out free food. Like, they've put out flyers in bad neighborhoods saying we're going to have open pantry Christmas Eve. One hour, we're handing out free food baskets. I have no clue how many people are going to show up. You know, free food. And I don't know what the food is. You know, and if not enough people come to get all their food, I will stand in line to find out what the food is. I will get a basket myself. Because I like food. Not exactly poor, but, you know, can't let the food go to waste, right? I have some poor friends that probably won't show up, so I can give them the basket. I just want to know what's inside it. You know? I don't get a Christmas. I'm an atheist, okay? So, I want to open something. I did get a Christmas present today from Cinnamon, um, and it was kind of a gag gift, but it was very useful, and I like utility in my gifts, if you're going to give me a gift, anyone. Um, she got me a uh, package of red Solo cups, because I was out of red Solo cups, and I was not happy one day because there was no sale on Mountain Dew in the uh, 12 pack of cans variety of sales and there was no sale on Coke which I will sometimes switch out to you guys never like see the Coke but it, it does happen whenever I, I drink whiskey I, I have Coke with the whiskey because it doesn't go with the Mountain Dew that well and it's that's how rare it is. I, I don't hardly ever drink, but I I had to buy two liters to get a deal because um, I, and I know this is very um, chintzy of me, but I will not buy soda unless it's on sale. And I will go to a different store to get the sale because I buy so much. You guys know that I buy a lot of Mountain Dew. So, I get three two liters and two were Mountain Dew. One was uh, for a friend, so it wasn't Mountain Dew. But I got these two two liters from, from, from that deal, right? It was like three for two dollars. But there was no no sale on cans. So I had to, I had to get the two liters to get the, the cheap soda. And I get them back to my market, to my office, and I start opening cabinets. And I'm like, where the fuck did I put the red Solo cups? You know, I have a whole market full of coffee mugs and glasses and crystal and booths and booths full of things to drink with. But I do not want to take something out of the market not even out of my own my own booth, and and use it, and then go clean it, and then put it back in the booth. You know what? Am I gonna drink it out of it with a price tag on it? No, I want my fucking red solo cup. So I was I was uh, opening file cabinets and and stuff just looking for red solo cup. So I guess it was funny. So for Christmas, cinnamon got me. Red Solo Cups. And, and another part of the story is that uh, someone came shopping in my market for uh, Secret Santa and they had a list of things that this person liked and the, thing, the things that they, they liked, they said, 
things that are red, um, antiques, and World War II memorabilia. Um, and I ended up giving this person my last solo cup, my last red solo cup. I didn't know it was my last, right? This is right before the, uh, the debacle with me not having anything to drink with. I gave her my last red solo cup, and I put uh, a 1944 penny in it, a wheatback penny, and I said, look, there you go, you know, and then you can give them, like, a bunch of candy to go with it or, or whatnot, because she has, like, a $3 spending limit for this Secret Santa thing, um, which I don't know how I feel about that. As a market owner, I'd, I'd want people to be able to spend as much as they want, but I, I know how much Christmas can get crazy with how much you got to spend on everybody. So I don't know how I feel about that. Conflicted. That's how I feel. Anyways, I gave this to the person. Cost me like total maybe six cents because red solo cups are like five cents each. And she bought some other stuff from the market for herself and then came back another day and bought stuff. So it was a good investment in, in a friendship with a customer. But, as it turned out, it was my last Red Solo Cup. And when I needed one, I didn't have one. And that sucked donkey balls. Big, juicy donkey balls. So to close... I'm going to share with you a story that I can share um, and make it a little bit more exciting. Um, my friend Stephen, um, Stephen King, not the author, but yes, his name is Stephen King. Um, he is uh, sheriff's deputy on the weekend, moonlights as uh, a security guard at a place that I will not name. And he also uh, helps out at my market on other days. So, he, he has a lot of hats, right? He was working as a security guard when a lady ran up to him and, and had a complaint about somebody in the parking lot. Now, the, the complaint that she was saying was she was in her car and this really angry guy walked up to her car and punched the window right next to her, the, the side window, for no reason whatsoever, and it startled her. And so as he, he, he kept walking, and so she opened the door, and, and said, excuse me, can I help you? At which point he uh, cursed her out using a whole bunch of expletives. Don't know what they were because this is a, like, second-hand story. I, I heard this from Steve because he took her statement. Right? So he's inside the building... Um, she comes up to him, because he's a security guard, and she wants him to co go out and uh, do something about this very belligerent man, who is obviously drunk. So, he gets on the dispatch, on his radio, he's, he's calling it in, that he's about to go outside the building and see what's going on like a good security guard should do, right? Following protocol. As he's opening the door to leave, he gets punched in the face by the same guy. Like, sucker punched. Blood gushing from his nose gets all over his uniform, right? And he was right in the middle of calling it in to police dispatch. You know, he wasn't on his police job. He was actually 
um, a security guard in that function, but he was calling the actual police dispatch, right? So, the guy is running down the street, you know, um, and a whole bunch of sirens are following. The guy runs into a Dairy Queen and then walks out the other door from the Dairy Queen and because he's drunk he thinks he just pulled some slick maneuver whereas like the 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 him that walked into the Dairy Queen isn't the same him that walked out like they they're like he just shook the people that were following him and he was kind of surprised when that didn't shake them so he ran down the street and got on the number three bus and so the police followed the bus and when they pulled it over they had the doors held shut for them so that they could board the bus to get him uh, at which time the uh, suspect fell when uh, exiting the bus and he fell into a whole bunch of police batons on the back of his legs and then he got tased so the the policeman that actually caught the suspect they go back to Steve, my good friend, and they tell him that he did the right thing by uh, not retaliating right there and, and calling it in, you know. But he was already on the phone, you know, on the radio with dispatch anyway. But uh, that he kept a cool head and, and called it all in. Um, so they were congratulating him, and, and the uh, manager of that building was very happy with his actions rather you know rather than being like more vigilante and, and having a fist fight right there he just called it in and took it like a man and had blood all over his uniform and you know and they told him that the guy had a rap sheet and he was already on probation and he was about to go to jail for eight years before he even like gets to you know whatever he gets for assaulting an officer okay that's going to be tacked on to the end of his eight years that he's now going to jail for instead of being out um, because of the sentence that he had before but you know he can't do anything like that so uh, somebody got taken off the streets that was a very belligerent drunk. And the guy's mom um, was was questioned. Um, and that guy's mom said that he was drinking because um, in this bad economy, they were about to lose their home. And so he got very angry at the whole world, and so he was walking down the street drunk and just wanted to pick a fight with anyone. And here's the, the, the funny thing where it gets to me. I'm, I call Steve like I do pretty much every day, and I hear about this, and I told him, Dude, you need to come to the market so I can take a picture of your uniform you know with the blood on it and everything and he comes to the market but a lot of the blood was, got on his like uh, black jacket that you couldn't see but there was a little bit still on his his uh, blue uniform and uh, his glasses were bent and he was on his way to the hospital because if something like that happens he has to get a blood test to make sure that he's not on drugs Steve the security guard on duty who get 
punched in the face, has to take a blood test to make sure that he is not on drugs. Because that's just the way the world works. Also, they kind of, you know, make notes in, in his uh, medical history, you know, in case he wants to do a workman's comp claim. But pretty much, it's just standard operating procedure that anything out of the ordinary that happens to people on the job, they have to go get a blood test to see if they're on drugs. And while I was talking with Steve, I had to ask him, you know, have you heard that that that, uh, that thing in in the news? Did did they set up send out a memo? Because it's it's this thing nowadays. I've I've heard about it that um, kids are playing this knockout game. You know. I was just fucking with him, but uh, it was pretty funny, I thought. Um, so yeah, Steve is uh, out of commission for a while. He's actually got the flu, and he thinks that it happened because the guy punched him in the nose and dislodged something that was, like, he had, he had a, the sniffles for, like, a week. And he thinks that it got into his bloodstream. Uh, I don't think that uh, the flu resides in your nose and, and gets cornered there. But, uh, yeah. He had a really rough day, and he, he really does blame it all on the guy that punched him in the face. And now he's kind of sick. I feel for him. And that's pretty much the most exciting story that I, I can tell out of my week. I sold a couple paintings. Um, I just got commissioned to paint um, Frida Kahlo, which I, I'm going to say this on my YouTube channel, but I'm not posting it to Facebook before um, this person gives it as a gift in two days for Christmas. I might not observe Christmas myself, but I respect that some people are buying things from me that they're going to give as Christmas gifts, and I, I don't think these people watch my YouTube channel, but you know, I can't tag this person who's a Facebook friend of mine that bought this Frida Kahlo painting that I did because then her friend might see her tagged in it. And, you know, I've got a couple of paintings like that that right after I watch Doctor Who's Christmas special, I'm going to post a whole bunch of pictures to my Facebook of things that I painted that I, I had to just sit on and not post, you know. But... As I was painting uh, Frida Kahlo, first I had I had to select a picture, and I just started thinking, you know, if, if this becomes an adventure, I am going to have a bunch of people who were talking about art with me before get really upset with my reactions to things, but that's okay. I'm just going to say how I felt. Um, I was looking for a picture of Frida Kahlo. Not a painting of Frida Kahlo. Not somebody else painting her. Not her painting herself. No. I wanted a picture of Frida Kahlo. Not an actress playing Frida Kahlo. I wanted the real Frida Kahlo in a picture. And I found a couple... Right, But as I was searching for a picture of Frida Kahlo, I realized that there are a lot of people who have butchered the image of Frida Kahlo. Like they, it's almost like they're trying to troll someone into suicide 
the number of fucked up pictures that have been painted of Frida Kahlo that look nothing like Frida Kahlo. And when I do post my picture of Frida Kahlo, I guarantee that A, it looks like Frida Kahlo, and B, it satisfied this customer. Okay? But there's a, a lot of impressionist versions of Frida Kahlo, and even of her own work. Some Sometimes I'm like, wow, she had like no self-esteem whatsoever. She was depressed. But it was like, for every one fucked up painting that Frida Kahlo did of herself, ten fucking trolls who know how to paint at least finger paint painted Frida Kahlo in a parody way of that one painting she did. And they're all over the internet, you know? And, uh... Yeah. My, my first impression in, in, in looking for a picture of Frida Kahlo was what the fuck did she ever do to all you fuckers to deserve being butchered like all you motherfuckers are doing and all these pictures of Frida fucking Kahlo that are fucked up I mean like horrible Hor like it, it's like a it's the whole point, is if you're going to paint Frida, you must fuck it up. A lot. Because that is the point of painting Frida, is to fuck it up. Right? Like, really, really, like... And, and if you're having problems fucking it up, like, put a whole bunch of extra paint on it, and then, like, tip it on its side to let it drip a little bit. You know? To really, really fuck it up. And if she was crying in her painting of herself, when you do your version, you make waterfalls come out of her eyes. Okay? Like, completely cartoon-like waterfalls, and you just make the f fuck fun of her. You know? Anything about her painting that you can um, discern as as something that, that happened to her in, that's different in that painting than her other paintings... You're going to take that little fact and you're going to exaggerate the fuck out of it and troll somebody who will never see your fucking artwork but just put it up there and, and make it look like there's an army of trolls attacking dead Frida Kahlo. That was my first impression when, when I was looking for a picture. Just a fucking picture. Okay. So, um, yeah. When I when I had that impression, I was like, "Wow, the Pollock fans, they're gonna hear that I hate um, impressionist versions of Frida Kahlo by other painters, and they're gonna go, go like, "Wow, is there any art that you really like?" And, yeah, there's a lot of art that I don't, and there's a lot of art that I do. And I'm one of those people that considers um, video games to be art. Um, whereas a lot of people that I disagree with don't. But as I was, I was painting Frida Kahlo, I was thinking about... Robert, Hatred 42, and how he would be like, you don't deserve to paint Frida. And I'll tell you something. Even though I, I still don't like Pollock or anyone who I consider to be part of a cult of fame or uh, famous just because they're famous and this in our day would be like Paris Hilton or Kim Kardashian or, or whatnot but back in the day um, I thought this way about the Beatniks 
um, when I when I learned about them and then read their works um, or listened to their works in some cases um, this this band of, of beatniks that all seem to know each other like a, a rat pack or brat pack or frat pack okay I just didn't like that they were giving each other the rub in fame like they're famous because they know other famous people and and it seemed like a lot of what they were doing other people could do and it was it wasn't very often that I felt impressed by the group of people that hang that hung around the beatniks um, now when we're talking about the poetry of, of Ginsburg um, I like Lana Del Rey's singing of I Sing the Body Electric um, her song version of it actually fixed the poem for me uh, but I also liked Kaddish, um, because I identified with, you know, having a crazy mom and all that. Then there was Kerouac, okay? And, it, and just like I have these feelings about Pollock, I have feelings about Kerouac. Now... There are a lot of things that he said in his writings that are quoted completely out of context, mind you. Like, uh, one day I'll find the right words and they will be simple. You know? Did he think that that, that would be a, a widely quoted um, catchphrase for journalists? No. No, that was just, like, another line in his, in his work. But, uh... To me, Kerouac, um, the the substance of, of his writing was crap. Okay, extreme, like stream of consciousness, um, going nowhere, uh, no real form or backbone as as far as a plot line, you know, just. And where I found genius in, in Kerouac was actually the, the, the on-the-road book, to me, it sucked. Really, really sucked. But the way that he wrote it was genius. And that's why I, I regard Kerouac as being like an important step in writing, but it's, it's not that I would ever encourage anyone to read that fucking book. It, it fucking sucked. What, what needs to be told is the ingenious way that he took a ream of paper, like a, a fucking spool, right? And he ran it through his typewriter. Okay? And for his stream of consciousness writing, he was on meth. Okay, homemade meth. And that's why his, his meat and potatoes of his story really aren't held together by any sort of glue or plot line or anything, right? Sucks. In my opinion. In my opinion. But, it, it was uh, brain vomit, right? But, the genius was that he thought that brain vomit was super fucking important. So important that he didn't want his brain vomit to be interrupted. So, he runs the paper through the typewriter. Because this was before word processors. Right? And it wasn't ten years later that word processors would take the place of that kind of a technique to the point where you wouldn't be 
interrupted. And now, then, another 20 years after that, everyone has a word processor or a computer, right? So it, it's like he innovated something right before it became obsolete. But it was an important step in the evolution of being able to produce mounds and mounds of work and a body of work that is greater than any authors of any time period before this one okay authors in in previous eras didn't have blogs where they could just publish to all of their fans and get it out to them instantly and have this stack of blogs fit on a hard drive they they would have newsletters you know 50 60 years ago they had newsletters and zines and whatnot that you know if you were to get to keep back issues you know like the newspaper does in an archive and like every newspaper has that that vault in the basement you know where they keep all of their their old editions uh, at least a couple copies of them in big bound journals you know now they can just keep that shit on on well first it was microfiche and now it's just on files on a computer you know so when i look at Kerouac there's a certain part of me that that doesn't appreciate the the content of the art but i appreciate the way that he made it for for what it was the innovation that was in that it's kind of like when you when you see a meth user use salt to clean out the the white paint on the inside of a light bulb after they break it you know it's like whoever figured out that salt would do that it's genius to me um or you know somebody who's smoking pot in in the boys room in high school and they use like uh dryer lint and fabric softener packed into a uh toilet paper tube to blow in it so that you know the the pot smoke doesn't get everywhere and you know if if these people just put their ingenuity to curing cancer you know so to bring this back to Pollock from, from my previous rambles um there are things that Pollock has has said and done, and he did with his uh, style that actually uh, influenced a lot of people, including me. I, I I either was influenced by someone who was influenced by him, or uh, just I identify with what he did. One of the things he did was he laid his paintings down on the floor instead of painting on an easel. I also do not paint on an easel. I put things down on a desk because I started with pencil and paper and I started with pen and ink and charcoal and it feels very awkward to raise my hand on an easel. In fact, it's very fucking tiring. I did that for hand painting a couple store signs for my shop and ow you know just fucking ow <laughs> it hurts it's like when i was back in the boy scouts and we had to hold up our scout sign for fucking ever if we messed up you know your arm gets really heavy maybe i'm just a wuss who's low t and doesn't have a lot of muscle strength but i find that i prefer to lay my work down 
Maybe not on the floor, because I'm not working on the scale that Pollock was working with. You know, I, I don't have to walk around it. I need... I can just spin it on the desk if I if I want to get a different perspective that way. But down flat is something that Pollock did, and it's something that I do, right? Um, also, Pollock said that uh, when he lays his stuff down flat, he would he would uh, more easily become immersed in it and become part of his art. And I don't know that it makes a difference for me, like whether it's uh, on an easel or down flat, but I do know the feeling of being immersed in my art to the point of um, ignoring everything else around me. Kind of like uh, having a drunk blackout, but not having a hangover afterwards. You know, just fast-forwarding through your day by painting a couple paintings and then poof! You know, where did the time go? You know? And then you look down at your phone and you've got three text messages that you haven't checked. You know, because you heard them, the, the alarm for the message, but did it matter? No! Because it wasn't the painting. The painting is everything. It's the precious. You know? So I get that about Pollock, that he um, would just shut everything else out and just become uh, a painting psycho, you know, like just completely zoned and obsessed into his, his work while he was doing it. I get that. It happens to me. So while I do, don't necessarily uh, respect the product of what he was doing, there are some things about Pollock that I can appreciate, at least on the identifying with uh, universal truths level, because I know some other uh, people who also get some sort of rush from creating their art, or they go into a zone, you know, Some people use artist therapy, and I and I completely get it, you know. And it's one of those things where a younger version of me might have uh, laughed it off, and and completely not voted for any sort of program that would have had veterans getting a program where uh, canvas and paper and paint was provided. I would think, that's a waste of money. You know? That's just a, a foo-foo band-aid put on things. But you know what? Um, I've seen the results. i felt the results. Um, and I will never uh, diss any sort of art therapy offhand. Um, and I will, I will never... Uh, make fun of helper animal programs either uh, because I've seen how fruitful they are for the people involved and I'm not I'm not just saying like helper dogs okay I I haven't met anyone who has a helper monkey but I'm not gonna knock it because I know how how good the helper dogs are my friend Heather's dog, Ripley, is an awesome stress dog, and he, all he's trained to do is when you seem stressed, he's trained to put his head on your lap or on your leg or something and nudge you, right? Or when you look like you're getting upset and angry, he's just supposed to nudge you. That's what he was trained to do. So that you'll remember, hey, I need to do some of that uh, calming the fuck down technique, you know? And I have actually set off other people's helper dogs to where their helper dog will come across uh, the room or underneath the table in a restaurant and actually rest their head on me, um... 
my friend Jason, um, he's in a wheelchair, and he's a medical marijuana patient with a helper dog. And his dog will trigger on me just like I have a nervous uh, habit of shaking my leg. I'm shaking my leg right now. Um, and it, it doesn't take a lot of nerves for me to shake my leg. I just kind of do it all through life. I'm a leggy shaker. Well, his dog is trained to sense him in pain. And when he when uh, that dog put nudges his owner, his owner, Jason, is supposed to know it's time for me to toke up. I need to go medicate, eat some candy, you know, that has some THC in it. That's what the dog has been trained to do. The dog has been trained to tell him um, it's 420. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, there are times when people don't realize what they are doing to themselves by either going too long without their medication or uh, working themselves up into a frenzy whereas a, a third party observer would be able to see that and you could train a chimp or even a dog to do that and it makes people's lives better just like paint therapy where you know you can't sometimes even see the connection between what is being painted and what the person needs therapy because of because not everyone gets touched as a kid and then decides to paint being touched for the rest of their life when they're whenever they're in therapy no they can paint flowers you know they can paint anything sometimes they can paint things that uh, have no discernible form whatsoever to anyone else and aren't appreciated by people that don't understand and want to but can't but even though the art might not be appreciated for um, not being discernible the results from making the art on the artist can be very visible so sometimes art has a value where uh, it's not about whether or not somebody can tell what you made and it's not about whether or not you can sell your art or if, if it's easy to put a price tag on it sometimes the value of the art is making art makes people feel good and I I didn't just make any argument that uh, anyone should be a sex addict or uh, smoke any crack so Hopefully, I've touched on my feelings in a way where nobody misunderstood, but I'm pretty sure that I said something fucked up, and somebody's going to call me on it in the comments. I don't know, but uh, I've made it to a minute five on this ramble that's pretty good I gotta get some sleep so I can see um, food and business clothes be passed out in the name of the Holy Spirit tomorrow <sighs> wonderful and hopefully it'll be a good sales day the day before Christmas and 
even surprising to me, um, I will have my market closed on Christmas. Not because of observing um, anything about Christmas so much as uh, there's a brunch I want to go to. And on Thanksgiving, three people walked in on Thanksgiving Day, and I was inside my market painting, and, you know, it was it was very easy to keep the market open, but I imagine even less people will think that anything is open on Christmas, so, um, yeah, not really motivated to be there. So, me, before Thanksgiving, I might not have made this decision. I might just be in my market like it was any other day and just, you know, move stuff around, do marketing on the computer and paint and handle customers. But me after Thanksgiving and, you know, wanting for at least one day off, one day off, I will take this fucking day. And I'm also taking December 28th off because I have um, level one driver's course to attend mandated by the courts from that, you know, ticket that I got for the accident way back when. So, yay. Two days off in one week. So stoked.